The Kaima Chalora Road Inquiry, also known as the Kirby Inquiry, was probably the most thoroughgoing planning inquiry ever held in New South Wales. David Kirby, seen here on the left with his older brother Michael, was a 35-year-old junior barrister when he was appointed to head up the inquiry in September 1978. Then as now, freeways were highly controversial. Four years earlier, the Willis Liberal government had met bitter public opposition to its attempt to begin the Los Angelisation of Sydney with the construction of an ambitious set of inner city freeways designed to funnel traffic into Sydney's CBD. When Labor came to power in 1976, the new Premier, Neville Rann, ordered the sell-off of the land the Department of Main Roads had acquired for the inner city freeways. Thwarted, the Department switched its strategy towards the implementation of the outer sections of its radial freeway plan. Citing the need to get container trucks to and from the newly established Port Botany, the DMR prioritised its 30-year-old plan for a southwestern freeway. This too was publicly unpopular, and the Kirby inquiry was Rand's response. The inquiry was the first occasion on which the American experience of the counterproductive effects of radial freeways on cities was authoritatively investigated. Its report, delivered in 1981, condemned the Southwest Freeway and the Cooks River Road proposals on social, environmental and economic grounds, noting that expert condemnation of the Southwest Freeway in terms of cost-benefit was all but universal. It also recommended a scheme for the railing of a high proportion of containers to and from Port Botany, and that the Walleye Valley's open space should be returned to the public. After delivering his report, David Kirby went on to serve in various roles on many important legal inquiries, including the Warringa Expressway Inquiry, the Gretley Mine Disaster Inquiry, and the ICAC Inquiry into Waverley Council. In 1998, he became a Justice of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. He retired from the bench in 2011. So David, in September 1978, you became the Commissioner of the Kaima Chalora Road Inquiry. How did that come about? Well, I happened that night to be going to the Opera House with my wife. I decided uh, at interval to go downstairs and uh, get a drink. I was standing to one side with my drink when I noticed the Premier Neville ran in a mm. circle of people. Mm. He stepped out of that circle and came over to me and said, David, how would you like to do an inquiry, a road inquiry? I knew him reasonably well, but not that well. Mm. And uh, I was surprised and said I'd be delighted. Mm. And I had imagined that what he was offering was uh, the position as counsel assisting an inquiry. Mm. It turned out that I was to be the commissioner of the inquiry. Mm. And just on that happenstance, uh, the history of, of Sydney probably changed quite considerably. Well, I like to think so, but it certainly changed my life. Now, what were the terms of reference when you came to pick them up? The terms of reference were that having regard to the findings of a symbolist inquiry into Port Botany and container depots at Port Botany mm. and studies that have been undertaken since then, mm. was a major road uh, following the uh, route designated the Kaima Chalora route mm. or some other route necessary um, and if it was what uh, were the likely uh, social and environmental and other impacts of such a road. Okay. But that's a long time ago, it's 35 years ago now. 
And the problems that your inquiry confronted are still with us. Sydney's still grappling, grappling with the radial freeways uh, issue with, with West Connex uh, now, and still grappling with the problem of, of big, threatening, dangerous container trucks uh, clogging uh, the roads of Sydney. That's still very much a burning issue. How do you see the importance of the inquiry today, 35 years on? Well, in many ways, I think the issues that were confronted at that time and the solution which was suggested mm. at that time, specifically the railing of containers mm. uh, from Port Botany, so far as that was practicable, uh, are still relevant today and indeed much more relevant today because now Botany is much later, much larger and in full swing. Mm. Now, Professor Ross Bundon, who became a very important consultant to the inquiry, uh, who what was he and, and uh, how did he come to be con consultant? Well, there was a document being prepared as a background document for the mm. inquiry mm. and there was delay in preparing it. Mm. And I therefore had time on my hands and I asked, I did two things. One, I read as widely as I could and I therefore came across his name. Mm. But secondly, uh, I got permission from the government to retain consultants. Mm. I made inquiries about particular individuals and everyone, I might say, uh, from the government, both planning environment and Department of Main Roads, mm. tried to steer me away from Professor Blunden. They said he was too old, that he'd retire, mm. and various other things. I am by nature, I confess, contra-suggestible, mm. and uh, I therefore decided to see him. Mm. When I saw him, I immediately recognised that not only was he an expert in the area of traffic engineering, he was a philosopher. Mm. And he really did see the big picture. Mm. And he was capable of explaining it in very simple terms. Mm. And he began my education mm. in this area. Mm. He was the, the, the first professor of traffic engineering in, in Australia, I think. I think he was. And uh, he was a very clever man, mm. a very quiet, uh, mm. quietly spoken mm. individual, uh, and a very modest man. Mm but his accomplishments were immense mm. and uh, he was a delight, frankly. Mm. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, a great Australian. He was a, a, a military engineer of some considerable distinction. I believe he was Australia's first defence, uh, chief defence scientist before he, um, before he, he founded the, the School of Traffic Engineering at UNSW. How did his expertise shape the inquiry? Well, as part of my education, he had a number of themes. Mm. One was that congestion, traffic congestion, is a fact of city life. Mm. Every city, including ancient Rome, mm. had congestion mm. and still does. Mm. And congestion didn't necessarily mean that you therefore built a road or widened a road or did anything in particular. Mm. It was, he was fond of saying that the reason that you had uh, North Sydney, a city the size of Adelaide, mm. was because of the congestion on the Harbour Bridge. Mm. This was before the mm. under, underwater tunnel. Mm. And what, what happens is congestion drives people to make other decisions, including seek other jobs and uh, uh, other centres develop in a city. Other centres develop right. so and North all, Sydney develop. It's not all in one going right into the centre, a single CBD. That's it. Yeah. So that was one of his. Mm. Uh, sometimes congestion does uh, suggest, inverted commas, sickness in the system where yeah. you must do something mm. about it. But that really depends upon, uh, according to his tuition, whether or not you want traffic to yeah. travel in that direction. Mm. And if, for instance, it's simply a radial road heading towards the C, the CBD, mm. then almost certainly you don't. Mm. Um, mm. So that was one thing he used to say. 
the other two things he used to harp on was bypasses by and large yeah. are very effective and quite yeah. good. And the third is orbital roads around mm. the city to enable people to get from one region to another mm. are likewise usually warranted and good. Yeah. It, the inquiry was a very big undertaking. Um, how did you set about constructing the process of the inquiry? I mean, obviously it's a, it's a big endeavour um, and you're trying to get a, an, a, an objective empirical view of the situation. How did you go about doing that? Well, the public's participation was clearly important and indeed there was a pamphlet prepared mm -hmm. which uh, was distributed very widely mm. and, it, and uh, it was in various languages because it was recognised that there were various ethnic groups mm. who were going to be intimately affected by these various proposals. Mm. And uh, ultimately um, the study which was being prepared by the government departments was also distributed widely and available. People were given time to put in their submissions mm. and the public response was extraordinary. Mm. I think quite unlike any other inquiry in the past, mm. I think there were 1,500 written submissions, some of them as big as a, a book, mm. frankly. Mm. Now, your report was very clear about the impact of radial freeways uh, on the urban fabric and I was wondering whether there was political or bureaucratic resistance to the concept of what we now call induced traffic growth. What's your sense of that? Well, in the period where I was reading widely, mm. I came across various documents which had been written, in fact, by uh, engineers within the Department of Main Roads. Mm. The Department of Main Roads apparently sent of one engineer, Ken Dobinson, mm. on a study tour to the USA mm. and he prepared a document called Car Cult Country, really? uh, mm. which was the result of his study. Mm. Mm. And to his surprise, as he sets out in the document, mm. Mm. Um, he, the traffic in Miami was as bad as the traffic on the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And that surprised him because uh, Miami and Sydney in the 60s both mm. did traffic studies, mm. uh, both suggested multiple freeways, mm. but Miami, unlike Sydney, built their freeways mm. and one could therefore see what the result was. Yeah. And the result was the city just spread out mm. and the traffic congestion on these freeways that had been built at great expense and mm. expense to the environment mm. um, was as bad as Sydney Harbour Bridge. Mm. By and large it was accepted then mm. and recorded in the, in the report mm. that they did accept that there was such a thing as induced demand. Mm. Perhaps the thorniest uh, issue before the inquiry was the question of containers. How are they going to be moved out of Port Botany? Because as I recall, there had been a, a huge controversy over the movement of containers through very narrow streets in Balmain uh, and uh, in the inner city, around the harbour, uh, that had raised a lot of uh, angst amongst residents, very understandably. So that was a very big issue for the inquiry. Um, the DMA really tried to tie the issue of container movements together with the radial freeway uh, thing. How, how did you see the relationship between the radial freeways and the movement of containers? This is important now because it's sometimes advanced, for example, as a, uh, a major justification or even the major justification for West Connects that it will be uh, a road for the movement of containers. Well, unquestionably, the movement of containers was a huge issue for the inquiry. The problem with the solutions that were being put forward, and it remains the problem for West Comics and other 
such solutions mm. is that uh, even once they're built, um, it will be at least 10 years before they come online mm. because it takes mm. some time to build mm. them. So uh, the, the problem that I faced was that even recognising the impact uh, of containers uh, and the transportation of containers mm. upon the road network, mm. is there a more immediate solution to that problem than simply waiting a decade and spending a lot of money mm. uh, in building a freeway? Mm. And that led to the investigation of the railing mm. of containers mm. and whether that was a feasible solution. Yeah. Now you actually crafted a solution based on a combination of, of, of road movement and rail movement. Just very sketch a, a picture for us of, of what was the solution that you, you put, put together on that one. All right, well, if I could just give you the background briefly. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the demand for containers mm. to be sent by rail, according to the submissions that were lodged with the inquiry, was deafening. Mm. Just about every submission yeah. says that as far as practicable, these huge vehicles which stand out in traffic, mm. which are terribly intrusive in shopping centres and residential areas if they pass through them, should be sent by rail mm. if that is practicable. Yeah. Uh, not only did they say it, but the experience in Balmain, as you pointed out, mm. also demonstrated that this was a large problem. And Symbolist in his report on Bot Port Botany had said that the permission to develop container terminals should be conditional mm. upon containers uh, being sent, so far as practicable, by rail. Mm. Neville Rann had publicly stated that his government uh, wished containers, so far as practicable, to go by rail. Mm. And the nine local government areas in their submissions, that is the areas from Strathfield Council to Rockdale and mm. every other mm. suburb in between, mm. had all spoken with one voice and said these things, so far as practicable, should be sent by rail. Mm. So we investigated that and there were basically three options which were examined. Mm. The first was termed the free market case and that was advocated by the shipping lines mm. and also by the container terminals but by others besides and the free market case was uh, it's a matter for the person who owns the container to decide how they're going to transport sure. the second option was a, a scheme put by the state rail authority which suggested there should be four depots uh, in Sydney and it should be compulsory to go to the nearest depot. Mm. The third option, and the one that I ultimately favoured, mm. and thought to be uh, completely practicable mm. uh, when we investigated it, uh, although it did involve some cost and did involve some double handling, but nonetheless practicable, uh, was called the Western Suburbs option. And that fundamentally divided, but not in an arbitrary way, mm. Sydney into two regions, mm. the western region and the, uh, the other region. Mm. And the, anything from the western region had to either be sent uh, by rail or come by rail mm. to the port. Mm. Now, um, the, uh, I should bring up here the issue of recreational open space and remnant bushland. It was a very big one in relation to uh, Walleye Creek and Cooks River Valleys. And of course, um, you know, the, the DMR in seeking out space to put through their motorways uh, were very much inclined to look for level routes with the fewest number of, of houses to knock down, which meant that uh, open spaces were, you know, existing open spaces, formal or informal, were very tempting to them. Um, that became, that was a very big issue in the inquiry and, and how did you see that one? Well, it was a big issue and one of the things we did um, enthusiastically and, and several times mm. was walk 
the entire proposed route, mm. uh, both in Cooks River and through Walleye Creek, mm. and each in their own way mm. uh, was very charming, especially Walleye Creek. Mm. Cooks River had been degraded but had enormous potential, yeah. um, and uh, so it was clear that there was going to be a huge environmental impact. But more than that, the, the Department of Main Roads, on one of these walks, because they used to accompany us, um, it pointed out where the freeway would go, so we could see exactly what environmental features would be destroyed. And a puzzling thing arose from one of our excursions. And that was that they seemed to position the freeway in the carriageway that they were proposing to build. Um, the first carriageway, because some of these were going to be built with four lanes and then four lanes later. That's right. Yeah. So the one that they were planning to build first was the most environmentally destructive. It was going to demolish the cliffs mm -hmm. to give... Mm -hmm. Undercliff or Arncliff, it's its name, I gather, mm. but uh, Girraween Park and mm. other mm. features which were precious to the community, and uh, that was made clear in submissions. So what and was the rationale for that? I inquired. I said, well, why on earth aren't you building this freeway? I mean, you don't know whether or not the second carriageway will ever be needed. Mm. Why aren't you building it upon mm. the hugging the railway mm. upon the least environmentally destructive? Mm. And they, uh, in during the hearings, answered with disarming frankness. They said, "Well, it's not going to get any easier in the future to do this, uh, so we may as well in, uh, destroy the features of the valley because people would come to value them." Well, more and more. they already valued them, mm. but the trajectory of environmental concern in the community mm. was growing yeah. so that in the future they could yeah. anticipate a bigger battle even than the one they had on their hands then. Yeah. Mm. Now, the inquiry's report was apparently well received by uh, Premier Rand, but what happened afterwards? Well, it was interesting, the, when the report was being written, this is in April of 1980, mm. there was a strike at the uh, Port Botany mm. and the very sorts of issues which I was considering in my report were mm. then being agitated by the various unions who yeah. were involved, including the Waterside Workers mm. Federation. Mm. And I then got in touch with the government and said, well, look, uh, it may be useful for you to know, in the context mm. of the present report, mm. what I'm planning to do, uh, because it may be relevant. Mm. And I'd done a deal of industrial law in my time at the bar, mm and I was not about to make a recommendation which was industrially naive. Mm. I was aware of the competing interests of the three unions involved, the Waterside Workers, the Stormen and Packers, and the Transport Workers Union. Uh, and the solution I fashioned uh, didn't give anyone everything. It, gave, it was a package designed to give everyone something, yeah. uh, but workable and ultimately something which would enable the, part, the port to function. And the unions appeared to accept that mm. and the, they went back to, to work. And I continued to write the report and then I submitted the report in early February of 1981. In April of 1981, I got, received an invitation from the Department of uh, Transport to attend a meeting which would consider the container report. Yeah. I went to the meeting and before the meeting I was ushered into uh, I think the Under Secretary's office and there present was Harry Quinn who was then the uh, uh, 
he was the secretary of the Transport Workers Union. Mm. And in my presence and his presence, the Under Secretary said to me, uh, David, I've looked at your report, but I have to tell you that I'm against compulsion. Mm. Because what I'd recommended was that for the western region of Sydney, people should be compelled to either send their containers by rail to that region or from that region to the port. Sure. Uh, and he said, I'm against compulsion. Mm. Now, until that moment, I imagine that Harry Quinn thought that the battle had been lost mm -hmm. because um, the Premier was in favour of the, the solution mm. and, and, and uh, indeed Harry Quinn, when I questioned him uh, in the inquiry on transcript, had said, well, yes, I can see that it's yeah. a reasonable option. Mm. Anyway, he, I think he then, this is my inference, but he changed his stance yeah. And ultimately, um, when the report was released in, uh, in I think it was in May of 1981, um, he immediately uh, shut down the port and said that if they implemented this, yeah. uh, then the uh, he would he would shut he would shut down yeah. everything. Mm. Um, the government, I might say, by that time had accepted it mm. and they then did back away from it and tried to negotiate something yeah. else mm. and then the issue got lost. Mm. And so, uh, in the end, I think... Uh, so idea today we have... Ideology prevailed over... 15 or 17 percent of containers going out out of the port by rail, whereas you'd recommended a, a just over 40 percent as an initial yes. uh, figure. I think it worked out that according to our modelling and expert uh, reports, it would be something over 40%. The inquiry um, changed the course of your career? Yes, it changed the course of my career and my life, really. Um, from that moment, I uh, developed a specialty at the bar, I suppose, which was inquiries, royal commissions, inquiries, mm. often as council assisting, often appearing for one of the parties. Mm. So in the next several years and afterwards in 1985, when I was appointed Queen's Council, um, I was council assisting various inquiries. You became the go-to guy for inquiries. Uh, well, I like to think that and uh, certainly that became the backbone of my practice and I love them. Mm. Uh, they're all different. They, such things as the uh, inquiry into the air crash uh, of the Seaview Air yeah. uh, aircraft on the way to Lord Howe Islands yeah. and uh, the Gretley coal mine disaster and so on. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were all interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, David. That's been wonderful. Thank you.